Uh, welcome everyone. Um, good afternoon. This is our final session for this year's uh, conference. Uh, for those of you that are joining for the first time, the way that we are organizing the sessions is that we will have 20 minute uh, presentation of the paper, 50 minute discussion, 15 minutes discussion, and uh, 10 minutes for uh, general Q&A. Uh, our first presenter is uh, Anjana Rajamani from Erasmus University, and she will be presenting the paper Real Effects of Stock Market Valuations, uh, Local Valuation Spillovers uh, in M&A. Anjana, uh, please go ahead. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see and we can hear you. All right, uh, perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Anjana Rajamani and I'm very excited to present a paper uh, titled Real Effects of Stock Market Valuations, Local Valuation Spillovers in M&A Activity. Uh, this is joint work with Frederick Schillingman uh, uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, who is also on the call here today. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to thank the program committee for including our paper on today's program and for giving us this great opportunity to present our work. Let me start with some brief motivation for our paper. So a large stream of literature has documented that valuation measures such as price to equity ratios and market to book ratios are positively related to M&A activity at the firm level as well as to with um, aggregate uh, economy-wide deal activity. The literature has posited various explanations as to why this relationship exists. The chief among them are that um, these valuation measures proxy for investment opportunities or capital market liquidity or potential misvaluation of firms. However, to the extent that these valuation measures proxy for such firm fundamentals, we do not know whether stock market valuations indeed have any real effects. What do we have in mind when we say real effects of valuations? We mean that non-fundamental changes in the valuation of, of firms affect their behavior, or in our context, M&A activity. Um, we are not the first ones to examine the real effects of valuations. For example, there's earlier work by Edmunds et al. And there's also a paper by uh, Olivier, Laurent, and co-authors uh, who are in the audience, um, uh, wherein uh, they examine how noise in the valuation of um, industry peers impacts the capex decisions of firms. All the papers that we are aware of, uh, which investigate the real effects of valuations, use mutual fund outflow-induced price pressure as a source of non-fundamental shock to firm value. However, in recent work, Wardlaw shows that these fund outflow induced price pressure is in fact correlated with firm fundamentals and as such um, can, may not be viewed, cannot be viewed as a non-fundamental shock to firm value. So this means that new evidence is warranted to corroborate the existence of real effects of valuations and which is where we come in. So what do we do in this paper and what are our main contributions? We examine how the acquisition decisions of firms are impacted by non-fundamental shocks to the valuations of their local non-industry peers. So we focus on shocks to non-industry peers because uh, shocks to the valuation are possibly more exogenous with respect to the focal firm than, for example, shocks to own industry peers. Second, um, we uh, focus on local peers and um, thereby contribute to the growing literature which links firm location to their investment decisions. For example, in recent work, Dugal et al. Um, find that the CapEx decisions of firms are impacted by CapEx decisions of other co-located firms. And finally, um, we corroborate previous evidence on the re real effects of valuations without relying on the mutual fund outflow induced price pressure as a source of non-fundamental shock. I'll elaborate more on this in a bit. Um, we are also able to quantify the wealth effects of acquisition decisions, which are prompted by noise in local peer valuations. Um, briefly, our data and methodology. Our sample consists of all publicly listed firms that are headquartered in the 20 largest economic areas 
by population in the US and the sample period runs from 1990 through 2019. Um, the economic areas are as defined by the Bureau of Economic Analysis and um, firms headquartered in the 20 largest economic areas in the US account for roughly 70% um, uh, of, of all publicly listed firms uh, by in the US by market value of equity. To this, we merge in uh, the data on uh, all control seeking deals announced by our sample firms and this data comes from STC. Our methodology is motivated by various challenges in the identification of fear effects. A first challenge is a reflection problem, which arises when the same firm appears as a subject and as a peer in the estimation of um, peer effects. So that is the same firm appears on both sides of the equation, once as a focal firm that is a subject to the treatment and at other times as a peer to other focal firms. Um, and, a, and a solution to this problem is simply to separate the subject firms or the focal firms of the analysis from the peer firms, which are the influencing firms. So to this end, we examine how the acquisitiveness of firms in non-dominant industries, uh, which are the focal firms in our analysis, are impacted by the valuations of their local dominant industry peers. Um, we focus on the valuations of local dominant industry peers because they tend to be more salient. Um, we identified those Pharma French 12 industries um, whose, uh, share, uh, whose share of market value of equity in an economic area exceeds 20% as being locally dominant. And with this, we identify roughly about one and a half dominant industries per economic area in our sample. Um, uh, to give you a sense of uh, what industries are identified uh, as being locally dominant, here are some examples. Um, for example, in the oil and, uh, oil and gas industry is being identified as locally dominant in the Dallas, Fort Worth and in the Houston Bay Down economic areas. Um, and the business equipment or software industry is being identified as locally dominant in the San Jose and Seattle economic areas, et cetera. So which matches with our common sense expectations. Um, so our main empirical specification, uh, the our dependent variable is the acquisitiveness of our subject firms, which are firms from non-dominant industries and different economic areas, where acquisitiveness is defined as the total value of all control seeking deals announced by the firm in a given year, scaled by its uh, beginning of year book value of assets. Um, and in terms of independent variables, uh, we control for the firm's own Q or the own uh, valuation and the valuation of its local dominant industry and same industry peers. So we note that we split a firm's uh, local peers into same industry peers and dominant industry peers. And dominant industry peers by construction are from a different farm of French 12 industry as a subject firm. We also control for the acquisitiveness of the local dominant industry and same industry peers and uh, for a broad set of firm characteristics. Uh, we include firm in the year fixed effects and <clears throat> cluster our standard errors by industry and economic area. In peer effects parlance, this coefficient lambda one is what one would refer to as an exogenous peer effect, uh, which reflects uh, how the actions of a firm are impacted by the attributes or characteristics of its peers, or in this case, the valuations of its local dominant industry peers. The coefficient lambda three is what one would refer to as an endogenous peer effect, which, wherein the actions of a firm are impacted by the actions of its peers. So note that both exogenous and endogenous peer effects constitute uh, peer effects. Both are considered peer effects and uh, they're not mutually exclusive. Our goal in this paper is however to tease out the existence of any exogenous peer effects. Uh, and one more important thing to note in this context is that the identification of true peer effects requires random assignment of peers which brings me to our next empirical challenge and that um, the assignment of peers in our context is likely to be not random. This is because firms may endogenously choose to locate around dominant industries with which they share investment opportunities. That is the local dominant industry valuations could be correlated with the arrival of investment opportunities for our subject firms. So to the extent that the coefficient on the local dominant industry valuation, lambda one in our previous specification, reflects such endogenous location choices of firms, it captures what in peer effects parlance is re referred to as a correlated effect 
rather than true peer effect. So to make sure that we are identifying a true peer effect rather than correlated effects, we use non-fundamental shocks to the valuations of local dominant industry peers. So we examine how idiosyncratic equity shocks to local dominant industry firms impact the acquisitiveness of non-dominant industry firms in an economic area. So using equity shocks allows us to corroborate previous evidence, for example, from Olivier and Laurent and co-authors on the um, real effects of valuation. And in doing so, we also take into account uh, some of the recent concerns from Ward Law on the previously used measure of fundamental uh, non-fundamental shock to valuation. So we construct the following alternative measure of equity shock, um, wherein we orthogonalize the firm's returns with respect to four portfolios, the market portfolio, the a portfolio of its local same industry peers, a portfolio of its non-local same industry peers, and a portfolio of its local dominant industry peers. That is, we are orthogonalizing a firm's returns with respect to the economy, its industry, and its location. We then average these, I'm sorry, we then average these um, equity shocks across all um, firms in a dominant industry in an economic area to calculate the average equ equity shock to the local dominant industry. So this brings me to our next empirical specification, wherein we split the local dominant industry valuation into an idiosyncratic equity shock component gamma and a non-idiosyncratic uh, component omega. And this non-idiosyncratic Q is simply the aggregate Q orthogonalized with respect to the equity shock. This coefficient lambda one zero uh, then captures the real effect of valuation because it reflects the responses of our subject firms to non-fundamental shocks to the valuation of the local dominant industry peers. And this coefficient lambda one one captures the correlated effects arising from the endogenous location choices of firms. So this brings uh, me to the end of our empirical settings, and now I want to present our results. So before I move on to present our main results, I want to start with an anecdote. So in the year 2006, in the Dallas-Fort Worth economic area, the uh, dominant industry was the oil and gas industry, and its average valuation was about two, uh, firms in that industry was 2.4. Firms in the shops, wholesale, and retail industry in that area had an average valuation of about 1.59, uh, but spent about 7.3% of their assets on acquisitions that year. I'll contrast this with the Philadelphia Camden economic area, where the chemical industry was the dominant industry and had a much lower valuation of about 1.28. And firms in the shops, wholesale, and retail industry spent only about 0.02% of their assets on acquisitions, despite the fact that the own valuations of these firms stood at much higher level of 2.63. So this goes to highlight the role the dominant industry valuations could potentially play um, in influencing the acquisition decisions of other co-located firms. So moving on to our uh, multivariate results, wherein we regress the acquisitiveness of our subject firms on their own valuations, the valuations of their local dominant industry and same industry peers, and the acquisitiveness of the local dominant industry and same industry peers, we find evidence consistent with the existence of exogenous peer effects, in that the acquisitiveness of our uh, subject firms are positively related to the valuations of the local dominant industry um, uh, firms. And uh, in economic terms, a standard deviation increase in the local dominant industry valuations translates into an increase of 16.4% uh, of, of, uh, in the acquisitiveness of our subject firms relative to the mean. If we aggregate this across all non-dominant industry firms in our sample, this translates into an increase of about $1.4 billion in deals originating from an economic area. And these results are robust to alternative specifications of the dependent variable and also of key independent variables and clustering techniques. Uh, and they also obtain in the extensive as well as in the intensive margin. A potential concern, oh, sorry, um, I forgot to point out uh, that we do not find any evidence of um, endogenous peer effects. That is, that the acquisitiveness of our dominant industry firms are not related to uh, the acquisitiveness of our uh, subject firms. So this is not consistent with managerial herding. So a potential concern with our findings is that some unobserved shock to the economic area is simultaneously driving the acquisitiveness of our subject firms and the local dominant industry valuations. 
So to address this concern, we we use the valuations of um, instrument, the valuations of our local dominant industry firms with the valuations of firms located outside the economic area. So as an example, um, for the auto, we would instrument the valuations of auto industry firms, which are the dominant industry in Detroit, with the valuations of auto industry firms located outside of Detroit. So the idea being that the valuations of firms located in Detroit and outside of Detroit are likely to be correlated, but the firms located outside of Detroit do not possess the Detroit specific valuation component in them. So essentially we're cleansing the local dominant industry valuation of their location specific component. So when we rerun our analysis with the instrumented version of the uh, dominant industry valuations, we continue to find a positive effect, um, positive relation with the acquisitiveness of our subject firms. So this suggests that our results are not driven by unobserved shocks to economic areas. Another potential concern could be that our results are driven by economy, some economy-wide shock. So to address this concern, we replace our subject firms with size and industry match firms that are located outside of the economic area. So as an example, we will replace the chemical industry firms in the Detroit area with uh, industry and size match chemical industry firms located outside of the Detroit area. Uh, so when we do this analysis, we find that there is absolutely no relationship between the acquisitiveness of our pseudo subject firms and um, the um, local dominant industry valuations. So suggesting that these valuations below us are limited to local peers and our results are likely to be driven by some economy-wide shock. Uh, moving on to the real effects of evaluations, uh, wherein, as I mentioned earlier, we split the local dominant industry valuations into an idiosyncratic component, equity shock component, and a non-idiosyncratic component, we find that our acquis the acquisitiveness of our subject firms is positively related to the equity shock component gamma, as well as the uh, non-idiosyncratic uh, component omega. And in economic terms, a standard deviation larger equity shock to the local dominant industry translates into 7% increase in the acquisitiveness of our subject firms, so which essentially represents the real effects of our local dominant industry valuations. And the fact that the firm's acquisitiveness responds to the idiosyncratic or noise component and the non-idiosyncratic or the signal content, the signal uh, information content in the valuation of local dominant industry is consistent with their inability, such as that they're um, um, unable to separate signal from noise, and which is consistent with the faulty informant channel of Mark et al. Um, in other results, we also we find that these uh, equity shocks are unrelated to the capex decisions of firms, which suggests that our results are unlikely to be driven by from some kind of model misspecification used to estimate the equity shocks. Because if that were the case, and these equity shocks were not truly idiosyncratic and possess some fundamental information, we would expect to find similar results on capex decisions. We also don't find um, any. Um, effect of these uh, idiosyncratic equity shocks to local dominant industry on the cash-based acquisitiveness of firms. Uh, I would suggest that these shocks are not proxies for increased capital market liquidity. We do, however, find a strong positive relationship between uh, these idiosyncratic shocks to the local dominant industry and stock-based um, acquisitiveness, which is consistent with an interpretation that uh, firms, these subject firms, are using these local dominant peer valuations as potential signals of their own overvaluation. And finally, in wealth effects, we find that the um, announcement returns are unrelated to uh, the aggregate uh, local dominant industry valuations, but are significantly negatively related to the uh, idiosyncratic shock component of the local dominant industry, that is gamma, and, uh, but unrelated again to the non-idiosyncratic non component in valuation. So this suggests that market is penalizing firms for their inability to parse out uh, the uh, noise uh, from the uh, information content in local peer valuations. And in economic terms, a standard deviation larger equity shock to the local dominant industry uh, reduces the announcement returns by about 14% um, relative to the mean. Um, in conclusion, uh, here's a brief overview of our findings. We find evidence of local um, valuation spillovers in M&A activity, and that these valuation spillovers indeed represent real effects. 
Um, the fact that firms are responding to the noise as well as signal component um, in these uh, local dominant industry valuations suggests that they're potentially trying to learn from peer valuations, but are not able to do so successfully because they're not able to parse out the noise. Um, our results also uh, highlight the role of firm location on their investment decisions. And it is important to note that these valuation spillovers only obtain in the context of acquisition decisions of firms and are not present in the context of CapEx decisions. And the fact that they are only present in acquisition decisions could be uh, consistent with an interpretation that um, uh, that uh, it is uh, they're potentially using these dominant industry valuations as signals of their own overvaluation. And finally, we show that the inability to parse uh, to separate the signal from noise in local peer valuations result in less efficient allocation decisions among firms, or at least in this context, acquisition decisions. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and we very much uh, look forward to Laurent's discussion and for um, comments and discussions uh, with the audience thereafter. Thank you again. Uh, that's great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anjana. Uh, now uh, I want to invite our discussion, uh, Laurent Reza from the University of uh, Lugano. Thank yes, you thank you. So can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you and we can see the slides. All right, so that's ex excellent. Uh, okay, so let me let me start. So thanks a lot for the organizer to uh, uh, to give me the opportunity to discuss this paper by Anjana and Frederick. It's nice to see many friends in the audience. So I hope everybody is, uh, is enjoying the conference and is doing well. So let me, uh, let me uh, give you a, a bit of a different take uh, on the paper. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and hopefully it's going to help. So the motivation, the way I see it is that they start with the, the claim that stock prices can, can provide useful information about fundamentals to decision makers. So that's, you know, you know this this idea that uh, financial markets or valuation in general can have real effects. So this is inspired by this uh, you know this this idea of, you know that dates back from Hayek. And so one condition for that to happen is that decision makers need to have imperfect information. Okay. So if they have perfect information, there's nothing to learn from anything. So they don't they don't go to look they don't going to pay attention to know anything else. Okay. So they need to start with imperfect information, and this imperfect information make them willing to learn about something. And so this could sometimes foster efficient allocation of resources, meaning that stock prices could lead to better allocation. But there is a but. We know that stock prices are noisy. And so this means that looking at uh, stock prices could provide information, but sometimes this create distortions. Okay, so prices could be faulty informants. Okay, so you look at the signal, and so the signal tells you that it's green, and so you go. But in fact, you you know, didn't account for the fact that sometimes the signal is noisy. So you should have you shouldn't have gone, but you couldn't know. And so if that's the case, decision makers may may not easily isolate the informative part of the price signal. Okay, so they look at the stock price, they see it going up, they say, oh, it's a great it's a great news. I'm going to invest. Maybe it's not such a great news because the price going up has nothing to do with a good opportunity. It's just noise. So now a note here is that the distortions that this creates might not be irrational, might not be mistakes. It might ju it's just coming from the fact that they don't have perfect information. Okay, so existing research has shown that managers do learn from stock prices and as also that the faulty informant channel, this idea that you know it's difficult to separate noise from fundamentals is at work. And so managers do not fully identify non-fundamental variation in prices. So most tests focus on CapEx. And so the idea is that you, you look at stock prices, your own price, the price of peers, because you want to learn from your growth opportunities. So now these papers does two things. So they focus on acquisitions and not CapEx. And they propose another way to identify or to isolate non-fundamental variation in prices based on firm's geographical location. So I think that's overall, this is very useful addition to the literature. So this literature on real effects needs more evidence, needs to have different angles. So I think this is, uh, this is useful and the picture is not yet complete. So I, I, I like the paper for that. So my discussion, I'm gonna focus on economic channels. I'm gonna say something about fundamental versus non-fundamental variation in prices. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the interpretation of the result and I'm gonna have some, some suggestions for the authors. So now let me give you a, a little bit of structure. So imagine that theta here is the NPV of an acquisition. So think of it as positive synergies. So omega here is the information set of managers. Managers has to make a decision and he has some information. In this information set, he has some private information 
We, the econometricians, we don't observe that. And he also has external signals. Could be you know, the prices of, of, of his own. It could be the prices of others. It could be you know, the Fed's you know, interest rates, whatever. Okay, So these are the external signals. And so he has to decide on whether he wants to make an acquisition. Acquisition is equal to one if the, ec the condition expectation of the synergies are positive and equal to zero. So they don't make the acquisitions if the condition expectations of the synergies are negative. So the test that the authors are, are running here is, is essentially this. So they're going to regress the acquisition uh, you know, viable, so acquisitiveness or you know, the probability of making an acquisition on proxies for omegas, proxies for you know, what's inside the information sets of managers and try to see whether there's positive loadings. So acquisition is going to be a function of private information that we do not observe and is going to be problematic and these external signals. So now the usual problem in learning literature is that we do not observe what managers know. And so what they do know, and we don't observe that, could be correlated with these external signals. Okay, so this creates a huge amount of problem. And so the idea that the authors have, I think is a good one, they say, well, maybe we should use noise uh, in external signals, because by definition, if it's noise, it has to be uncorrelated with the private info. Okay, and it's going to be able to, you know, make us say something useful on what are the drivers of these m and acquisitions. So it's a bit of a different take, but this is the way I think of, of the paper. And so the main, the main result is this. There's a positive correlation between the acquisition of a focal firm I in a given location and the valuation of the dominant firms or firms in the dominant industry in that same location. Okay, so there's this positive co correlation. So this is from the regression. So you see that this is Q dominant local. And so all these control variables here are going to be elements of these omega set. Okay? So they're trying to control for all the sources of information that managers use in order to make these decisions. So I think there are a bunch of central questions and they're going to be a bunch of whys. So the first why is, you know, why is the valuation of local firms in dominant industry should be part of this information set? So they rely on these notions of saliency, but they don't really explain why. So I think you need to motivate a little bit why is it rational for managers to condition the decisions on that specific piece of information? So why does it matter for acquisitions? And so are we sure that this is not correlated with private information? So I'm going to come back to that. So the interpretation of the author is this. So they say that this positive correlation, and I think it's very plausible, happens because managers use the valuation local dominance industry as a source of relevant information to decide on MA. And they cannot distinguish the part of this valuation that's noise. Okay, and so basically they the part that's irrelevant to them. Okay, so if it's noise, it should not be part of this uh, information set. So the, basically the info, the faulty information channels that work. So I have to say it's really unclear to me why Q dominant local is relevant in the first place. I think the author should really explain what managers are trying to learn about. Are they trying to learn about investment opportunities? Are they trying to learn about you know, misvaluation? I think that would be very helpful uh, if they could clarify a little bit. So what is really in the information set Omega? I think the paper would greatly benefit if we can uh, understand that a little better. So now learning about what? So one possibility, there are many possibilities, but one possibility, and I think this is what the authors have in mind, is that firms are going to try to learn about how mispriced they are. The idea is this, you know, local peers are overvalued, so maybe I'm overvalued too. And if that's the case, maybe I can buy more company. Okay. But you know, somehow this doesn't really fit well because this should somehow be captured by your own valuation. So now another possible story is this. It's based on relative valuation and cheaper targets. So now local guys are, are, have a very high valuation compared to distant guys. So this means that distant companies might actually be undervalued. This makes them good targets. Okay, so value of distant peers is lower, relatively speaking, so they are cheap, so I buy them. Okay, so this could be one potential story. So I think this is in line with the logic of the instrument based on relative valuation. So I would encourage the authors to explore a little bit this channel. Another, another possibility is that you know, there is an overall local and non-local shocks to growth opportunities. Could be that they, you know, customers overlap across industries. So now there's no economic link between dominant and non-dominant, but they have the same customers. And so when I see a boom in one industry, this means a boom coming for another industry. And so the problem is that this could be correlated with private information. So now, one thing that I was a little puzzled about is that the authors uh, also show us that there is a positive correlation between the acquisition of a focal firm in a given location and the valuation of 
dominant industry firms in other locations. So it's clearly not only about the local component. Okay. So then the question is, why is Q dominant lo local part of Omega? Why is it a relevant part of information to decide on MNA? So is it that it contains relevant information? If that's the case, I think it needs a little bit of a justification. Maybe it correlates with private information. Maybe this is faulty informant. You know, managers believe that there is information in other location, but there's no, but they cannot make the difference between what's relevant to them and what's not relevant to them. But I think you should dig a, a little deeper here. So the second part of the paper is, is addressing the difficulty to separate these channels and, and try to use to decompose uh, the part of the valuation of this dominant local into something that's fundamental and not fundamental. Non-fundamental because you want to, to it to be orthogonal to the private information that you, you know I don't observe and you don't observe. And so here they follow Leary and Roberts, and so they're going to try to extract the idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic you know, equity shock. So they do that for every single firm. So they strip out you know, the returns that they can explain, and they're going to focus on the residual. They're going to aggregate these, these residual across all the dominant firms. So this is going to be the noise from the perspective of the focal firm. So my question is, 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 is it really noise? I mean, can we really be sure that this is unrelated to fundamentals? And so I believe it could be, but I think we, we would need a little more explanations for why it is likely to be the case. And so, you know, here for the, for the instrument to bite, it has to be either, you know, largely positive or largely negative. Okay? Because on average, if you're going to average, you know, error terms from a regression, you're going to have, you know, a bunch of zeros. Okay? So here you're looking at situations where you average those, it's going to be positive or negative. So what does it tell us? When is it that when you average residuals in a regressions, you can have something that's non-zero? So one possibility is that there is an increase in stock prices that is very locally specific. So one example that, that I could come up with is this. Imagine that there's a bunch of leading uh, Detroit car companies that have just invented new battery technologies. Not all car companies in Detroit, but some of them. So now investors know that, so they see potential. And so that's where you're going to have this positive equity shock. It's still idiosyncratic because these not all firms in Detroit are going to benefit from it. So now non, you know, local Detroit-based non-car managers, they could see potentials, okay? Because this technology could be use, useful for something else. And they start going on an acquisition uh, campaign simply because this is part of their private information. And so I think this is possible. So I think this is your job to, uh, to prove me wrong. And I have some suggestion for that. So now in Larry and Roberts, they run a, a you know, large amount of batteries of tests in order to validate their instruments. I think you can benefit from trying to use some of these. But another idea would be to really see the following. If really managers view misvaluation as you, as you claim they do, we should see it somewhere else. Okay. They should not only go on, a, on, on, on acquisition uh, campaign, but maybe they should, they should start trading their own stocks. Right? Or maybe they should start you know, issuing equity or repurchasing their equity. Uh, or they should you know, look into uh, expanding their capacity through investment. This is apparently not the case. Um, but I think you know, it would be useful to really spend a little bit of, of time you know, convincing the reader that you know, this is really noise. So this is really orthogonal to uh, to what firms uh, use as fundamental choice. So now another possibility that I that was thinking about is a financing channel. The reason why I, I say that is that if you look at your, your appendix table, it turns out that finance is a dominant local industries in 10 out of 20 locations. Okay? And so I could see, I could think of two possibilities. One is this, maybe it's a little far-fetched, but let me, let me tell you anyway. So when local finance is booming, the cost of funding may fall for local firms. And this could lead to you know, many acquisitions by these local companies. Another one could be the following. Local finance is booming because there is a plenty of local acquisitions opportunity. Okay? And so these banks are going to help these firms. So it's going to drive business. So that's why they're booming. So it's a bit of a reverse causality. So I think you could, you could investigate that uh, uh, in, in different ways. But I think that's, you know, that's something that you want to get out of the way, this, this local financing channel. OK, so I have three suggestions. One is this. So why don't you look at the difference between local versus non-local acquisitions? So you all bunch them together, but I think you can learn a lot by trying to understand whether they buy locally versus non-locally. Why is that? Because if, if this is really something about an, an overall overvaluation that is local, it's more likely that they buy somewhere else. 
because if they want to buy local, it's going to be very expensive, right? So I think they, could, they should use their own valuation to buy in cheaper place. So I think making the distinction between local versus non-local could be, could be important. Another idea I think that, that might be uh, interesting is to look a little more deeply into the structure of industries. So there might be economic links between local dominant industries and focal firms. So you want to make sure that learning, even if it's faulty, is only happening if, if the information is relevant in the first place. Okay, so you kind of want to, to see whether there is an industry connections because otherwise, you know, these guys are going to shoot in the dark and that's basically not what, what the, your predictions would be. So another idea is to look for other proxies for, you know, private informations of managers. The more information they have, the less they should learn. So the less strong your channel should be. So ideas could be whether they're experienced, whether they've done well in the past in terms of acquisitions, whether they benefit from the local networks, where they should rely less on this valuation of local firms because they have this private information. Okay, so if you see variation in the intensity of your results across this dimension, I think it would help. So I have another uh, comment on, on whether it's optimal, exante, and exposed. Let me, let me skip that in, 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 in the interest of, of time. So one last comment. So you insist a lot on the paper, in the paper that you do not use outflow-induced price pressure. And so you cite many times this paper by, by Wardlow and his work by Berger. I, I, I think it might still be interesting to, to use that. So it could be that it does correlate with the author's new measures. So what you want is that it does not correlate with, the, with your measures. So I think there's still something that you can learn. Another note is this. So my, my PhD student uh, that was on the market this year, Roberto Tubaldi, has a very interesting paper. So where he's actually using hurricanes as local shock to liquidity demands. And this basically generates price dislocation in non-affected stocks. So now, Basically, the long story short is that it reinstates the value of outflow-based measures, okay? Basically saying that, yeah, Wardlow has a point, but this is not because he has a point that you need to throw everything. If you focus on the right events, the right outflows, there is still identifying non-fundamental variations. So I, I mean, I encourage you to read the paper and potentially uh, get in touch with him to use uh, his stuff. This is very good. Okay, so let me conclude. My takeaways, I think it's a very interesting paper. Real effect of finance is an important topic. There are many dimensions that, uh, that are still to be explored. I think the, the story that, that the authors are, are putting forward is very plausible. Uh, I might be biased because I've worked in the area and I believe that uh, prices are important and sometimes uh, provide faulty information. Uh, my suggestion would be to insist a little more on clarifying the economic channels and to try to help firmly establish that this is really noise and not something that's related to fundamentals. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, Anjana, do you want to briefly respond? Well, thank you very much, Laura, for those really insightful comments and also giving us a slightly more theoretical perspective uh, to our uh, to our approach. And uh, we we fully agree that we need to motivate better as to uh, why uh, firms might want to look at these local peer valuations. Uh, but we are mostly building on the work of um, um, uh, Dugal et al, wherein they focus on the role of local peers. Um, and to your point, uh, and I, I obviously can't uh, respond to all of them, but to one of your points that um, these relative valuations could be in play, we find that these acquisitions take is, are equally happening in the local as well as non-local firms. So it does not seem like these um, acquisitions in response to these high valuations are limited to non-local acquisitions, it also happens um, for local acquisitions. So. Um, don't know if that is enough to rule out your relative valuation story, but uh, uh, that's something we haven't put in the paper yet. But uh, yeah, but uh, thank you very much. And we look forward to receiving your slides and working through them in great detail. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, may I please ask if uh, my co-author Frederick wants to add anything to what I've said? Uh, uh Thank you so much, uh, Laurent. That, that was uh, uh, super, super uh, insightful and useful for us to uh, uh, work with uh, on, on, on refining things. Um, I think some of the uh, pieces uh, Jan already answered. Um, looking at the industry structures, uh, we have some alternative ways we've done that. Uh, it's not in this version of the paper, so certainly important to bring that back in. So we've looked at the Oberg uh, measures, for example, and, and a few other 
ways in which we can uh, maybe identify uh, 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 industry connections beyond sort of uh, industry code. So uh, that, that, that's great to hear that. Um, the one thing you brought up, I mean, it's something that has haunted me ever since I read the uh, Dugal, Parson and Titman paper, um, where they do kind of a similar thing in terms of uh, trying to rule out um, uh, local shocks the same way as we do uh, by using essentially uh, the subject firms from another area. Uh, I think it deals with that question, but it does open up the question that you raise. Um, but at the same time, I think it also then answers part of your other point in terms of um, I think what you call local financing uh, effect. So that may be uh, answered to that, that extent as well. But, but there is this sort of nagging uh, uh, side effect. Like if, 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 if you find a result there, what makes it purely local or not? So that, that, that's something I think we have to think uh, more about uh, if there's another way to address this. Um, other than that, I don't want to take up too much time and let other people ask questions, but uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you all for um, being here, and thanks to the organizers for including this paper on the program. There's a little bit of a history here, and I'll get to that in one second. Um, this paper, can you still see my screen? Uh, no, the slides <laughs> disappeared. Uh... Uh, that happened. How yeah. about now? Yeah, it's back on. It's back on. Okay. It's all very mysterious. This is why it keeps disappearing. Um, okay. Right. Okay. Uh, well, thank you all for being here. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for, for organizing this session and for inviting our page to be part of it. Um, the a little bit of history here that's interesting is that this paper was accepted to be on this program in or around March 2020, and an agonizingly long 15 months has passed since then. Uh, and a lot of things happened in that 15 months around the world to a lot of you and to a lot of us. One thing that happened that had nothing to do with a public health disaster is that a paper was published that you know, scoops or takes over about half of what we have here. So I'm going to walk you through what we have here. Um, I'm going to hopefully give you some context for it. And then at the end, I'm going to tell you exactly what this other published paper has, um, has overlapped with our paper and then how we, we, we think we're going to have to refocus this paper somehow. But a lot has happened since this paper was accepted for this program, uh, including that. Okay, let me um, start with a little bit of uh, context here. Um, this paper is mostly about equity analysts. And so what equity analysts do is they do a bunch of stuff. There's nothing to do with the M&A market in most cases. Uh, they monitor the firm's managers. There's a long literature starting with Jensen and Meckling about how um, external equity analysts are good monitors of the firm's managers from an agency perspective. Uh, they also generate information. So that second uh, arrow down here, my cursor is the, you know, what analysts do, one of the things they do is generate information about the firm. And that reduces information asymmetry between the firm and outsiders. And they also, uh, there's some literature that what, one of the things that external equity analysts do is they uh, contribute to investor recognition. They help investors understand that there is this firm out there that's doing this thing. And particularly that's valuable for small firms. No one argues that that's important for Google, but it might be important for a smaller firm that an analyst follows a firm. And so investors get to know about that firm and about their business. To this point, that has nothing to do with the M&A market. And so what we're doing in this paper is saying, uh, well, what is the impact of that activity on mergers and acquisitions? Uh, you can think of M&As as being a combination of a, an acquiring firm and a target firm. And there is a fairly extensive literature by now uh, about what the effect of equity analysts is on the acquiring firms in an M&A deal. And you can think of that as being uh, kind of driven by this top uh, row up here, monitoring. So if we think that on average, at least, acquisitions are negative net present value projects, and we think that analysts are 
contributing to the external monitoring of a firm's management team, then it makes sense that um, the, there may be some effect on M&A decisions from the, um, the, the activities, the coverage of analysts because they're performing that monitoring role. But there's been very little done about the effect of, at least as of the point that this paper was accepted for this program, there was very little done about the effect of equity analysts on target firms. And you know, analysts do a lot of things. They monitor managers, they generate information about the firm, they help investors recognize the firm. And so our thesis going into this project was that there's likely an effect on um, target firms broadly defined uh, from the activities of analysts. And let me give you a couple of flavors for what we think might matter here. Um, one thing that might matter is just pure coverage. And you can think about that as, you know, in the, the way that we think about this is most probably most importantly in terms of investor recognition or market recognition of the firm. So if a firm is covered by analysts, it maybe more likely shows up on the dashboard of an investment banker who is trying to recommend an acquisition to one of its clients. Okay, so it's, it's possible that a firm is more likely to become a target if the market knows that that firm exists because of analyst coverage. In other words, just coverage per se might matter. Just the fact that the firm is covered might be important by analysts in terms of recognition in the overall market. But then analysts do some other things as well. They um, reduce information asymmetry, for example. Um, and by, you know, doing research about the firm. And one of the important things that analysts do is generate price targets for the firms that they um, are covering. I shouldn't use the word target because it gets a little confusing in its context with target firms and price targets. So we refer to this in the paper as price forecasts. So you know, most analysts produce a price forecast of where they think that the um, they hope that targets that a given firm stock price will be a year from now, for example. And so we're going to use those as a um, proxy for the information that is being generated by analysts. Um, so th those are our two main research questions. Does, does coverage per se affect the likelihood that the firm becomes a takeover target? And do, do, do the analyst forecasts that they generate about the firm before it even becomes a takeover target, do those have any information content and help uh, discern what's going to be the outcome from an MA negotiation? Um, the kind of important dichotomy here, uh, I'll talk about the two variables we have in a second. The, the important dichotomy here is if you look at the first bullet point, um, the paper that was recently published has nothing to do with that. If you look at the second bullet point, they have everything to do with that. So there's a paper that's been published which uh, more or less takes over most of what we've done in the um, second bullet point. But I'm going to give you some context for what we have and, and how we think about this problem in a way that uh, I, I think will help us um, eventually refocus this paper in, in a way that's, that's publishable somewhere. Okay, um, what are the summary of our findings? Uh, it's going to turn out that analyst coverage per se significantly affects the likelihood that a firm becomes a takeover target. That's uh, nice to know that you know, firms that are covered are more likely to be found in, in an M&A search. As many of you will know, um, deals often come to firms because their investment banker suggests that they should acquire a given firm. And so you can think of this as you know, just analyst coverage increases the visibility of a firm and makes it more likely to show up on you know, a CFO's desk as a potential acquisition target or on an investment banker's desk who's recommending that acquisition to their uh, client. Okay, so, so let's separate that out from you know, coverage per se matters for becoming a takeover target. Now, what happens once you become a takeover target? Once you become a takeover target, it seems like the information generated by analysts matters a lot more. But the information generated by analysts, as you'll see soon, doesn't matter at all for becoming a takeover target, but it does matter once you become a takeover target. Once you've become a takeover target, uh, the price forecasts that uh, analysts have made well before you became a takeover target, those are significantly related to takeover premiums. And the way that we think about this uh, is as follows. 
if an analyst thinks that a, a particular firm has very high growth potential, then those firms get higher taker premiums in, in the main deals. Okay, so acquirers are paying bigger premiums to buy more growth effectively, which makes sense because one of the things that acquirers are buying in the takeover context is they're buying, buying growth that they can't uh, generate organically. Um, analysts forecast also that information they generate plays a significant role in the method of payment that's chosen by the acquiring firm. I don't think we understand that effect as well as we understand other ones. So um, you know, the result is there. I'll have something to say about it when we get to the, to the, um, to the table, but I, I don't know that it's so clear to me what's going on right now in, in that particular context. But the first two things on that slide that um, coverage per se matters and that the information generated by analysts matters in terms of the uh, premium outcome in, in the name negotiation. Those two are fairly intuitive to me. Okay, um, I'll, I'm not going to spend much time on this. Our sample is fairly standard. It's uh, from SDC. The thing to be aware of with our sample is that well, the targets are public, but the acquirers don't have to be. Why does the target have to be public? Because it has to be, we have to know whether it's covered by an analyst or not. And some firms are not covered by analysts at all. And some firms are covered by a lot of analysts and some firms are only covered by one or two analysts. So we're gonna get variation in the number of analysts that follow a firm. Uh, and other than that, the, this sample is, is very standard. What I wanna spend a couple of minutes on here is the um, idea that, um, where am I? I'm gonna to talk to you for a little bit about, um, the um sorry just getting, trying to figure out zoom here on this computer um the thing i want to think that we want to think about here is this notion that we have um in our sample some data that other authors do not have and so what i want to talk about is the structure of our data and how we think this might help eventually um what most people know about from SDC is this public announcement when a um, deal is announced to the members of the public and it's announced, uh, there are often SEC filings that accompany the announcement, there are often press releases, uh, sometimes press conferences, sometimes analyst days where the acquirer and the target managers talk about their potential deal, which um, hasn't been completed yet, but, but, but is now public information. And so one of the things that my co-author Ting Ting has been involved in a lot in her career, in her young career, is the idea that um, along with Harold Mulherin and Audra Boone, who I think is in this audience, is that this idea that and Audra and Harold uh, published this, the first paper about this you know, probably 15, 20 years ago now, that this public competition is only the tip of the iceberg for what we really see as going on in negotiations and competition in the M&A market. And so not only is there a public negotiation period where these two firms have announced they're gonna merge and it hasn't been completed yet, there's lots of I's to dot and T's to cross before the deal actually gets done. More importantly, there is this private negotiation period. And that was the point of Bruno Malherin uh, in the journal of finance that there was this negotiation period that happens behind closed doors, which we as the public don't get to see in real time. We get to see it in once the deal has been announced. So once the deal has been announced, at least in the US, the um, acquirer and sometimes the target, but often the target, sometimes the acquirer, will have to file SEC documents. And those SEC documents often describe what went on behind closed doors before the merger was publicly announced. Okay. So there was this whole private negotiation period that we get a glimpse of in um, after the fact. And so oftentimes there is a deal initiation date. We're told what date the acquiring firm and the target firm first started talking. We're told what the first bid price was. We're told a lot of stuff about negotiation behind the scenes and how the target went from the initial price that the bidder offered frequently to a different price that the bidder offers behind closed doors, and that becomes the initial public price. And uh, what we get, what we have in terms of our data, and this is great that Ting Ting has done this, is we have these data on when these deal, when every deal in our sample was initiated. 
And to the best of our knowledge, we're trying to figure out who it was initiated by. Was it bidder initiated? Was it target initiated? Because that's going to matter for the um, for the progress of negotiations, presumably, uh, when um, uh, who has more bargaining power, who initiates the deal, has, probably has the least bargaining power. And then we're going to take that date when the private negotiations were initiated. Remember, those aren't public yet, but they will eventually be public. We're going to take this private date, and we're going to go back 12 months, and we're going to measure analyst coverage. And we're going to measure two variables that uh, we think matter for analyst coverage. One is just, was the firm covered? And how by how many analysts? And so that's going to be that top variable there. The top bullet point is the log of coverage, the natural log of one plus the average number of analysts that follow the firm during that 12-month period. And it's going to be important for you know, kind of thinking about reverse causality here to remember that we are studying the coverage of the target firm, what will become, whoops, what will become a target firm. We are studying coverage of them by analysts in the 12 month period prior to when the deal is initiated privately. So uh, the difference, the, the, the gap between the private initiation and the public announcement of a merger averages about nine months. So we're talking about almost two years before the public learns of the deal for the first time, presumably. This is a lot of insider trading, but two years before the firm is identified as a target firm is, is the period in which we are measuring the coverage by analysts. So it's unlikely that analysts are covering the firm because they believe there's going to be a takeover. It's possible, but, but it's unlikely. We'll talk about that as we go on. And the other variable that we're interested in here is the um, analyst price forecast growth. That's the percent difference between where the target stock price was when the deal was privately initiated. We're going to call that the, the benchmark price for the target shares and what the average uh, analyst price forecast was for at, at that time for you know, analyst hopes or expectations for what the, that firm's stock price might grow to in the next 12 months. And so we're going to call that uh, analyst price forecast growth. And that's going to be our proxy for the information that's generated by an acquisition. Okay, I've got five minutes to go. I will uh, start to accelerate here. Um, probably one of the easiest ways to, to think about what we're doing in this paper is just to start with some brief summary statistics. And so the first row here is the um, average of that analyst coverage variable that I just talked about, log of one plus the number of analysts following the firm. And the second row is that information generation proxy, the, the forecasted, stock price growth for that firm before it became a target. And so what something like this is asking is, the results you see in front of you is asking is that, did, for target firms, are they different than other firms? And the question is, what's other? So we what we do is analysts often um, are assigned industries to follow. So it's important that we're gonna think about analyst coverage as mattering. We need to have kind of, a non-treated sample, if you like, um, of matched firms that should be in the same industry, and they are. And so we we, we require that they be in the same industry, the, the matched <clears throat> non-takeover target firms. And we do the match in two different ways. One is one-to-one, -one, so it's the firm in the industry with the closest size, size differential in absolute terms to the, the then target firm. And we're sort of one-to-five, which is the in the same industry and the five firms with the smallest size, size differential. It, the results don't vary that much based on, on this margin. Uh, target firms that become targets after the fact have more analyst coverage than matched firms in the same industry, matched by size and by industry. And those differences are significant. And that's gonna end up being our first major result in this paper is that coverage matters. Firms that are covered by analysts are more likely to be taken over, significantly more likely to take over. On the other hand, the information generated by analysts doesn't seem to matter all that much. In the second row, the price forecast growth for firms that end up becoming target firms is not statistically different from the price forecast growth in matched firms, industry and size that don't become takeover targets. Okay, so coverage matters for becoming a target, but information generation doesn't seem to. So obviously we do this in a multivariate regression context and you know, those same results hold that I just talked you through. Uh, the effects are pretty large here. So if you um, increase coverage by one analyst from the average, 
it's associated with a two to four percent increase in the probability of the firm becoming a takeover attack. So coverage seems to matter and it seems to matter a lot. Okay, there's some, you could think about um, some um, explanations and some issues with this. You know, we think this is most consistent with um, a firm recognition or visibility story. Coverage by analysts just makes the firm more visible to the market, both, um, both investors and also potential acquirers. You think about some endogeneity issues in the second bullet points down. One of them is reverse causality. Maybe it's not the fact that coverage is causing a takeover, but the takeover causes coverage. In our opinion, the timing just doesn't lend itself naturally to that explanation in the sense that uh, we're measuring analyst coverage so much prior to when the actual deal is consummated that it's hard to believe that analysts will be covering the firm uh, because of what kind of takeover time. I mean, it's possible, but it's, it's unlikely. Then there are some other things we do in the paper. Um, you can, one of the big issues that's standing here is that um, maybe the, there's some underlying, and this is kind of obvious, there's some underlying characteristic of the firm that makes it more likely to be covered and more likely to be taken over. If it's a good firm, for example. And so we do a couple of things to try and um, protect against that. And, and by and large, our results hold just fine, whether we use this um, impact threshold of a confounding variable, which I'd never used before, um, but uh, is it, the details are all in the paper if you can read about it. And we also do some standard instrumental variable stuff. Okay, let me, I'm gonna skip now to, since I'm basically out of time, I'm skip to the conclusion here, because I've covered what I think of as our most important point. Analyst coverage plays an important role in the identification of potential takeover targets. So what I skipped over uh, in those last 30 seconds there was, that the equity content of analyst reports has a material and substantial impact on m and negotiations, including who initiates the deal, what the method of payment is, and um, what the in price is that's paid by the acquiring firm. The reason that I skipped over all that is because that's in this paper that I referred to earlier that kind of appeared within the last year or so, because it's been, as I said, 15 months since we got into this, uh, onto this program. Um, the paper is called The Information Content. It's at the bottom of this, it's in the bottom bullet point here. The Information Content of Target Price Forecasts, Evidence for Mergers and Acquisitions. The next slide has the abstract. This paper investigates the informativeness and value relevance of analyst target prices in the context of MA. Our results indicate that firms with a high 12 month ahead target price relative to current stock prices are more likely to become targets and they will get higher premiums and, and so on and so forth. So, the kinds of things that are, are specific to that particular variable, which we've used as a proxy for information generation, have already been published in the literature. That kind of steals the thunder out of that part of the paper, which is why I skipped over those results in my um, presentation here. Uh, what is unique about our paper is not just the, the fact that coverage matters a lot, which doesn't appear to be in that uh, other published paper, but also that we have this whole structure about what the negotiation periods look like. And I personally think that that's where our paper is going to end up going. It's going to end up going into a realm where we take advantage more of what we know about private negotiations, which those other authors do not and, and frankly cannot measure. Like if they wanted to get the, the data, but they don't at, at, at this juncture. Okay, thank you very much. I'll stop sharing and uh, hopefully we'll move on. That's great. Uh, thank you very much, Micah. Uh, now I would like to invite our discussant, uh, Maxim Mironov. Maxim. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, that's great. We can see your slides. Um, okay. No, perfect. Um, okay, so um, I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time on contribution because, because Mika explained quite well. So uh, uh, it basically has uh, three main results, according to my opinion. So uh, first results, which firms covered by more analysts are more likely to be uh, to become the cover targets. Uh, the second, uh, greater undervaluation. Uh, which is uh, evaluated by analysts implies a higher premium. 
and um, public bidders also experience high coverage if they um, acquire targets with um, more analysts. So it's quite interesting paper with interesting results. Uh, a lot of results uh, are quite new. Uh, and I'm going to devote my discussion mainly not by results, but to uh, comments uh, how uh, authors can improve um, the paper according to uh, my analysis. So um, um, where is my... Uh, video okay so i don't know why video disappeared but okay so um um, um as it's clearly uh stated in the paper indigeneity it's uh, one of the main issue and um i don't think that reverse causality is a big problem so i agree with mika it's not a big deal so it's very difficult to argue that uh especially that author uh, measure analyst coverage like 12 months prior negotiation so I don't think uh, this is a serious problem, but immediate variable is um, much more serious problems, and um, I will try to explain um, uh, why. Uh, and uh, moreover, um, construction of the sample, I think it's also require more thinking and more analysis because the sum of um, reported results might be exactly consequence of construction of the sample. So uh, let's start with um, um, uh, uh, the first method. Uh, honestly, this is the first time um, I saw this method. It's probably a lack of my education, but I had a look. So it's uh, so this uh, first uh, method, an uh, impact ratio for a confounding variable. So it's mainly discuss let's say, what percentage of variables we can exclude in order to result holes. And uh, as the author note, there is no standard critical value for this analysis. So let's say if we have a very strong uh, omitted variables, which uh, impact both uh, dependent and, uh, and independent variable, we're still going to observe this result. So, um, but again, probably I'm not expert on this method, so probably it's, um, it's valid in this case, but I just... Um, not um, in the position of uh, 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 criticizing it. So I will uh, switch to um, uh, IV method, which is uh, much much more traditional and uh, much more common to uh, tackle such kind of issues. So as author use uh, lacked analyst coverage to predict uh, uh, future analyst coverage. And the idea is uh, that if um, broker hires more people, of course, these more people are going to cover more existing companies. And this is sort of an um, instrument, so the size of the broker. I think the main issue here is that basically we use historical uh, coverage to predict future co uh, coverage. And uh, these variables are quite stable over time. So let's say if company was covered a lot um, last year, it's very likely it's going to be co covered a lot next year. So in some sense, even though um, it's sort of instrument, but these variables are highly persistent. And uh, we basically can see it. So uh, uh, I illustrated uh, by regression um, uh, of, of the first stage of regression in a one to one uh, match. So if you look at the future analyst coverage, the only significant variable in this regression, in this sample, is a previous uh, analyst country. So, so expected coverage is a variable which is built on the previous um, uh, coverage. So we see that total assets, market to book ratio role, and all important variables which you think should affect analyst coverage doesn't matter. So in my opinion, uh, inclusion of uh, previous analyst coverage is almost the same 
as uh, inclusion of um, uh, future analyst coverage. And uh, I'm not sure that exclusion restriction holds for this instrument, uh, because we can think that a uh, company's decision to acquire from is not like, uh, uh, is not uh, uh, fast. So companies can think about few years uh, before start, uh, start negotiation. So let's say uh, our previous analyst coverage can affect uh, future decisions. So um, I think exclusion restrictions uh, can be related and, um, uh, in, in, in this case. And similar problem exists when we analyze um, undervaluation premium. Because analysts can just reveal undervaluation. And I basically, I, I did uh, show like some summary statistics which hint towards expiration. So it's not like a undervaluation. So analysts uh, show undervaluation and people react. So we can see just some undervaluation across from, for example, due to poor management. And both analysts can see this undervaluation uh, uh, and people who are going to acquire this film also see this uh, undervaluation. And uh, higher tech uh, premium can be explained, for example, by Nash bargaining. For example, you see a high undervaluation uh, due, uh, uh, due to poor management and uh, acquirer can uh, buy this target and create out of value. So they split the difference, let's say 50-50 uh, by Nash bargaining. And uh, uh, this alternative story, which I present here, is going to generate uh, uh, similar results, uh, results which uh, uh, we expect in the paper. Okay, uh, um, some other issues. So um, I started with uh, the most important issues according to my opinion, but I am um, going to also mention some other issues which I think quite interesting. So if you look at one to one and one to uh, five matches, we basically can see that uh, the coefficient for uh, the key variable uh, has quite significant uh, difference in estimation. So I don't have a, a raw data to estimate the difference, but uh, I'm uh, pretty much sure that if I'm going to run a formal test about the difference, uh, like this uh, 0 0.552 coefficient and 0 0.276 coefficients are going to be uh, statistically uh, different. Uh, because you see, like, t-stats are crazy, like uh, 7 and 10. And um, so it means, like, if it, let's do 1 to 10 much, it's going to be different estimation, 1 to 3 much. So I would like to see some discussion why different samples produce significantly different estimates for the key variable. So what is a correct uh, estimation in some sense? Uh, um, of course, it's very easy to critique uh, indigeneity. It's like everybody is very smart to critique indigeneity, but it's much more difficult to suggest what to do. So I, I was trying to think how I can uh, help uh, in this direction, what kind of a suggestion um, Mm, I can think about. So I like the idea uh, which, which is presented on the paper to look at the difference across years on analyst coverage. But I would look at the more radical change in analyst coverage, uh, in, 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 uh, for example, due to bankruptcy of investment banks. Because obviously, if uh, some investment bank goes bankrupt, it's going to close all... Uh, his uh, all his operations, and we are going to see significant change in all firms covered by this bank. And uh, to, for example, uh, where we can look at this shock, we can look at years 2008 and 2009, which is inside the time frame of the paper. So we can see what um, uh, analyst uh, or what investment banks actually were bankrupt, and um, this is sort of a uh, um, exogenous shock, and which is, uh, in my opinion, it's very much more easy to defend as an exogenous drop in analyst uh, uh, um, coverage. And I would construct a sample, not 
unconditional, but conditional on being covered in 2007. Let's say they look at all fronts which were covered in 2007, but some of them, let's say, were unlucky to be covered uh, by uh, banks which were then bankrupt, but some not. And I will see whether you can replicate this result. Okay, and uh, some other uh, issues which I think are important. So I copied like a sample selection issue, uh, the same table as we saw in the uh, presentation. So if you see, we basically go like from 40,000 uh, observations to uh, 13 countries. And um, um, I agree that all these field, majority of these filters are reasonable. But properly, uh, what we see is that a lot of uh, analysts come not from the fact that um, uh, the firm uh, became targeted, but probably because, let's say, it is included in uh, all these databases like uh, ISS, SEC Edgar, and so on. So I assume that inclusion of this uh, uh, selection criteria artificially increase uh, number of analysts covered by target firm because I would like to see what is the average number of target firms included in anchor database and not. So run such kind of a, a placebo test. Uh, 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 put like a non-target firm, target firm, but which uh, didn't put all this uh, uh, criteria inclusion in this database. And if you find that uh, still this uh, target firms has more analysis, so it's more like inclusion in these databases, not, um, uh, not um, uh, uh, target firms. And um, uh, my last, uh, uh, okay, uh, so, and you, um, my last comment uh, regarding to matching. You match in your paper on in the stream size. But if we go to summary statistics, we can see that uh, these uh, firms are also different on some other important variables like industry, uh, like sales growth. So as you can see, like, uh, for example, sales growth in uh, targets, like it's 11%, sales growth in much more 24%. So I assume that these firms which have 11% um, uh, growth rate, they're not so efficient. So they are more likely to be uh, uh, targets for acquiring, improving, um, management and so on. So um, I think if you match, size is not enough. So I would see match on some uh, uh, key performance uh, variables, which are also important potentially for target acquisition. And the same cash, cash I think it's not so important because, um, but um, sales and market to book, I think it's quite important performance man management and um, uh, which might be uh, um, related to uh, possibility of target. Um, uh, yeah, I hope I'm on time. Uh, this is, uh, oh, one minute. I'm one minute uh, before uh, my time expired. Yeah, this is uh, pretty much um, all which I wanted to say about um, uh, this paper. Uh, that's great. Uh, thank you, Maxim. Uh, Michael, would you like to respond briefly? I'd just like to thank Maxime for a great discussion. He pointed out several really important issues, probably the most important of which is the one he discussed first, which is good that it went in order. Um, he talked about the endogeneity issues we have in um, the coverage selection models. And I agree, we need to do more there. There's no doubt about that, especially because that's likely to become the focus of this paper going forward. Um, thank you for a great discussion. And if you could send me your slides, that'd be fantastic. I'd appreciate that. Thank you.